We give thanks for the opportunity to share in the bounty of this place and to protect it. We are all one in the sacred web of life that connects people, animals, plants, air, water, and earth. Let us use our spheres of influence as courageous conversations learners to rebuild our understanding of history in a way that amplifies the voices and lived experiences of the marginalized people, past, present, and future. So thank you everyone for being here with us. Um, just a quick few couple of quick reminders before we get our session underway. Uh, one is that you'll notice that we've all been, except for the person who's speaking and presenting, we've all been muted and uh, we won't have access to the chat. So for the next 20 minutes or so, our entire focus will be on our speaker. And then after that's over, we will open up the chat and everybody's option to turn on their audio. Um, and we'll ask that you put your questions in the chat or your comments or raise your hand and you'll be recognized and asked to, to uh, give your input. So um, that's our process. Um, also a quick reminder to keep watching your email for um, information about the last session, the last homework and the last session. And lastly, just a reminder that so much of our session is based on what we are learning from the grounding virtues that we shared in the beginning. So just a reminder, if you're not feeling familiar with those, you might wanna reach back into one of those emails and check out that document. It's really helpful. There's six grounding virtues that are powerful reminders for us about how we wanna engage in these conversations. Thanks everybody. All right, thank you, Shalini. So this morning, I am super excited for a couple of reasons. Number one, the podcast was just brilliant to listen to, and there's so much in there. And the other thing is that our guest this morning is Susan Clark, and I'm gonna share my screen while I'm chatting, just so I can give you her bio. But while I'm sharing my screen, I want to say that this, this whole program that you're part of, Courageous Conversations, is actually a program under a larger umbrella that is, uh, is coming through a grant from the Vermont Humanities Council. And the umbrella, uh, the umbrella mission is Why Civics Matters. And so the Vermont Civics Collaborative is about six to eight people that get together once a month and talk about the programming that they're going to do and they collaborate, their organizations talk to each other uh, and decide how they can work together to do this civic work um, and to put on these projects. And it just so happens that Susan Clark is part of that Vermont Civics Collaborative. And so this is truly a collaboration and it's, it's really exciting. Um, so I'm so glad to have her here and I'm so glad to introduce her to you all. So I wanna say welcome to Susan. Uh, and this is her book. She has authored this book, co-authored this book, and one other that I'll get to, but Slow Democracy. And so Slow Democracy is a site dedicated to local decision-making that is inclusive, deliberative, and citizen-powered. It is based on the book, Slow Democracy, uh, Rediscovering Community, Bringing Decision-Making Back Home by Susan Clark and Woden Teachout. Susan Clark is also the co-author of All Those in Favor, a book about Vermont town meetings, and she's the town moderator of Middlesex, Vermont. So together, we're all going to be, well, Susan's going to be doing a presentation, but together we are looking deeply and closely and listening uh, to the podcast called Befriending Radical Disagreement. Um, and if you haven't heard the podcast, I just suggest after you hear Susan and, and discuss today, go back and listen to it and it'll inform this discussion even more. So uh, without wasting any more time, I would love to introduce Susan Clark and welcome to the room, Susan. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you. And thanks so much for having me. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm, uh, I'm really honored to be sharing this space with you on a Sunday morning and thank you to Kataman Arts for convening us. Um, 
I just want to acknowledge this, this moment with George Floyd's murder and Derek Chauvin's uh, trial so fresh in our minds. Um, it's a challenging time to be focusing on this theme of befriending radical disagreement. Um, but perhaps there, there is no issue that's more relevant uh, as well. So, so far in our series, this group has delved really deeply into conversations about race. Um, and um, today I'm just gonna adjust our gaze a little bit more broadly to address uh, differences of all kinds and how we can live with or even befriend uh, radical disagreements. Um, I'd like to start with a quote from E.F. Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful. Some of you are probably familiar with that book. <clears throat> he wrote, through all our lives, we are faced with the task of reconciling opposites, which in logical thought cannot be reconciled. For example, how can one reconcile the demands of freedom and discipline in education? Countless mothers and teachers, in fact, do it, but no one can write down a solution. They do it by bringing a force that belongs to a higher level where opposites are transcended, the power of love. Divergent problems force us to strain ourselves to a level above ourselves. They demand and thus provoke the supply of forces from a higher level, thus bringing love, beauty, goodness, and truth into our lives. So I guess we should be grateful for divergent problems, right? <laughs> but it's hard. It's hard. Today's issues are serious. There's the extraordinary racial reckoning that we've been addressing, but also climate activists are leading an ecological reckoning. Simultaneously after perhaps the most polarized election in American history and the storming of the US Capitol, our democracy hangs in the balance. And I'm not even counting the social and economic and equity impacts of COVID-19. Many of us feel deeply drawn to take action but we need to do it in a sustainable way. One that isn't counterproductive and one that doesn't exhaust our energy and drain our souls. If we're going to live in a time of radical disagreement, how can we befriend this experience? In her opening letter, Krista Tippett wrote, I have seen that wisdom emerges precisely through those moments when we have to hold seemingly opposing realities in creative tension and interplay. So what, what skills is it gonna to take to endure this tension between polarities and to stay open with grace and vulnerability and even love? To examine this question, I'd like to kind of step back and, and look at where we are today. So right after the last presidential election, 20% of Republicans and Democrats told pollsters that members of the other party lack the traits to be considered fully human. Think about that. One fifth of party members literally think we live in a nation of monsters. And we do have real differences, but today's polarized atmosphere also exaggerates them. Studies show that Democrats now believe that Republicans are richer, older, crueler, and more unreasonable than they actually are. And likewise, Republicans believe that Democrats are more radical, godless, and gay than they are in real life. And of course, many of us feed our own misperceptions. We limit the diversity of our friendship groups and our media sources. And meanwhile, media and political operatives take advantage of those differences to energize their bases. And social media algorithms are designed to escalate our pre-existing biases. So we spend our days panic scrolling through the outrage industrial complex. And it really, it hurts. Tell, tell me if this is a familiar like gesture in your household after 2020. We just wanna hold on to our heads. It's one of the most polarized moments in history and we have this like collective hangover, right? And, and actually hangover is not a bad comparison. We have all got this universal headache caused by the polarization bender that we've been on. Many of us on all sides, my side, your side, my crazy uncle's side, have been binging, whether we mean to or not, on a diet of confirmation bias. Why? Why do we do this? It's because polarization actually is an addiction. Our brains crave certainty. Human beings are suckers for a simple good versus evil narrative. There's brain science now that shows us that humans were designed for polarization. There's this well-known study, it was done in 2006, but it's been repeated many times since then. 
and it's always confirmed, the researchers wired up some voters to explore what exactly happens inside our brain when we receive new information and especially new information that does not fit our worldview. So a group of self-described Republicans and Democrats were subjected to unflattering information about their party's candidates. And according to their MRIs, when subjects were shown information that contradicted their biases, their brains actually under-processed it. The section of their brain responsible for conscious reasoning, the prefrontal cortex, hardly even fired. <laughs> and instead, the emotional circuits of their brains lit up. So basically, participants' brains used emotion to ignore information that they didn't want to hear, but that they couldn't discount intellectually. And there's more, get this. When we go through this process of reinforcing our pre-existing reward uh, beliefs, the reward centers of our brains light up. So it's like a drug. We get a hit every time we ignore information that challenges our worldviews. Now, evolutionarily, this has been good. Polarization builds teams, which helps us survive. But it is terrible for solving problems. How can we come up with new solutions if our brains won't even allow us to hear each other, let alone take in new information? We, we can't. So there are many social scientists, people like Jonathan Haidt, if people are familiar with, with him, he's the author of The Righteous Mind. Terrific book, by the way, I recommend it. Haidt explains that this kind of us-them mentality is largely innate. We're born with it. It gives us a survival advantage you know, back in, in when we had to band together in tribes for protection. And to be clear, in the case of liberal and conservative worldviews, Haidt explains that we aren't simply talking about opinions. We are born with many of these qualities. So they're part of our identities and we're wired to defend them. So what do we do? How do we depolarize? Part of the trick is to frame conversations in a way that does not challenge a person's identity. We can use our full intellectual capacity better when we don't trigger this us, them, fight or flight response. When we frame issues and engage people in a less polarizing way, we can bring people out of their corners and find a way forward. And it's especially important at this moment in history because many of today's hot topics, climate change, immigration, economic disparities, are what analysts call wicked problems. A wicked problem is especially hard to solve because it's got competing underlying values. So, you know, if you think about it, most problem solving models focus either on expertise or activism. But this is key. Wicked problems are inherently different. They don't respond solely to expert technical solutions or to political slogans. They respond to slow, trusting, face-to-face -face communication. So for this, this polarization hangover, the hair of the dog that bit you is not going to help. Organizing even harder and arguing even louder won't be enough to cure this bipolar headache. The cure for our polarization hangover is, it begins with patience and listening and, and the knowledge that with wicked problems, it's the problem that's wicked and not the people. And this understanding, I think, is how Matthew Stevenson, an Orthodox Jew, found the courage to invite Derek Black, a white nationalist, to dinner. Krista Tibbet, I thought, did a masterful job of revealing some of the keys to Matthew and Derek's success. And I'll just name a, a few that struck me and inspired me. Um, the first one was curiosity. Both Derek Black and Matthew Stevenson could have just stayed home on the couch. But instead, they reached out to discover what the world offered. Curiosity is so critical to this moment. And it inspires me. I'm inspired to emulate the courage and the openness that it took on both of their parts. A second one is discipline. Uh, the, you remember that they joked that uh, they were trying to avoid talking about the harder stuff, so they talked about religion instead. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it would have been easy, and it is so easy to sort of fall back on, on rage uh, and, and what we don't have in common. It's too easy to do that. And I can only imagine the tact and the self-control that it took them on both sides. <clears throat> and number three, patience. These Shabbat dinners went on for over two years. That's over a hundred dinners, you know. There was no instant gratification or any guaranteed gratification.
ratification, except as Matthew pointed out, they were friends. I think Matthew and Derek's differences were stark, Orthodox Jew, white nationalist, and well-known, which makes their story dramatic. But for most of us, the differences in our lives are more subtle. The majority of us in Vermont live in small, rural, overwhelmingly white communities. And it doesn't mean we're homogeneous. In fact, we have some very extreme differences. But the differences are in some ways trickier to navigate because they are less visible. But still, I think as Vermonters, we can tap into a familiarity with polarities because we have been living with them for centuries. So let me just share with you what I mean by this, and you can sort of consider whether it jibes with your experience. Many of you have probably heard um, of uh, Northern Vermont University, his, uh, the historian Paul Searles and his book, Two Vermonts. Um, <clears throat> when he wrote that book, Two Vermonts, what did he mean? Uh, he, he, as a historian, he identified that as the industrial era progressed, so he was talking about the sort of 1865 to 1910, a split emerged in Vermont between two Vermont populations. And as a sort of handy shorthand, he calls them the uphillers and the downhillers. Um, so uphillers, you might kind of think of hill farmers. Um, these are folks who valued local cooperative relationships. So they're self-reliant egalitarians. They operate informally on a handshake. Uh, it's typical of pre-industrial America. And I might add uh, many traditional cultures. So those are the uphillers. The downhillers, you might think about villagers or mill owners. Um, these are folks who valued efficiency, uh, competition, markets, uh, formal contractual relationships, and they're more comfortable with the concentration of power in large institutions. <clears throat> so so a, an oversimplified example, if your dog, if your neighbor's dog is barking, who do you call? If you call your neighbor, that's an uphiller tendency. If you call the animal control officer, that's a downhiller tendency. So can you kind of picture, picture the, the division that I'm talking about? I see some, see some nodding heads. So these are values that continue today. And each of us has a, you know, a mix of uphill and downhill running through us. But uh, you know, a recent example comes to mind for me, Act 46, school consolidation, the idea that for efficiency, you could merge school districts from the top down. It's a, it's a very downhill notion. And uphill values like local involvement, small scale place-based decision-making are often not respected or even really understood uh, by downhill systems. Now, interestingly, and this isn't just Vermont, this idea that our identity is defined in part by our relationship to community has resonance um, with other research. And I'm thinking in particular of David Goodhart's work in England um, between what he calls another two other two groups, the somewheres and the anywheres. So the somewheres understand the world through uh, sort of a long-term, it's often a place-based uh, relationship. So things like farming, mining, um, local industry. Um, these are folks who tend to value tradition, uh, social contracts like families and community. And they do, they live in the real world, they evolve and they have, you know, are responsive to changing norms about race and gender and other issues, but they do prefer change to be moderate rather than rapid. And as Goodhart puts it, somewheres believe there is such a thing as society. So an interesting way of describing a group of people. Anywheres, on the other hand, are sort of cosmopolitan elite. So rather than a place-based identity, they have what's called an achieved identity. So it's based on education, on career success, they're comfortable with change, and they can live anywhere, right? So a trait that anywheres and downhillers share is that they want to change things. And that, uh, you know, kind of what is right for them must be right for everybody. Uh, and anywhere just kind of assumes that a somewhere is just a person who hasn't become an anywhere yet, right? But again, these are not lightly held preferences. They are worldviews their identities. And as Goodhart puts it, the somewheres aren't going anywhere. <laughs> so if we oversimplify and kind of write off the somewheres, often in more rural areas, um, uh, think of them as nostalgic or you know backward relics, we do so at our peril. Goodhart makes the case that the growing lack of understanding and respect between these two worldviews 
helps explain both the rise of Brexit and the rise of Trump. It might help us in these difficult conversations and befriending radical disagreement to remember that many of these somewhere, the norms and practices, things like volunteerism, local engagement, trust, have for centuries allowed communities to regulate selfishness and make cooperation possible. Jonathan Haidt calls, calls it the hive culture, like a beehive. And ironically, many well-intended progressive policies, although they're aimed at helping individuals, end up harming the communities that they're in. And Haidt points out, you can't help the bees by destroying the hive. So Vermont is in the process of expanding and evolving our collective identity, and that is great. But to do so successfully, we'll need to recognize the dynamic tension that it's gonna create and make those changes with respect for one another. And part of that is acknowledging the culture and traditions that have helped make our community strong so far. And I have no doubt we can do it. Vermont is far from perfect, <laughs> but we have some natural advantages that help us uh, and have helped us understand each other for a long time. One of them is climate, right? Vermont is a hard place to live and we share that. Winter, I'm looking out the window, it's finally, I think, over right now. There's daffodils, there's daffodils out there. Who among us doesn't feel that in our bones right now, the sense of spring? And when someone says to me that they have just survived their first winter in Vermont, I can share that celebration with them. And if they tell me they've been here for a decade, that's 10 winters, right? I can feel that. Or if they tell me that their family has been here for seven generations they're saying something to me. Or if they tell me that they are of Native American descent, each of these statements is embedded with meaning for us. And it's an opportunity to connect. Another Vermont advantage is scale, right? Our post-colonial settlement patterns were a response to our natural landscape. And we are still clustered in small, we've got these hilly, these hilly mountains and we cl we're clustered in, in small human scale communities, there's you know over 61% of Vermonters live in towns of under 2,500. So that gives us an opportunity to know our neighbors. We are the second most rural state in Vermont by those standards. The only one that's a titch more rural is Maine. And our town meetings, of course, are part of that inheritance. These are tiny, tiny legislatures. They're dedicated to self-governance through direct democracy and year after year, decade after decade, century after century, it has changed our democratic DNA, our expectations of how we can and must make decisions together. So we can use these to our advantage. Shared experience over time, it's what builds social capital. Trust, neighborliness, reciprocity, these strong democratic skills, they are a powerful inheritance that we really need at this moment. As Vermont faces the 21st century with all of its complex cultural issues, it's helpful to keep the dynamic in mind. And those of us who have downhill, kind of anywhere tendencies, we have this incredible opportunity to lift up what is best about the values of our neighbors. And meanwhile, the lens might also help us more rural place-based Vermonters recognize and empathize with what it feels like to be othered. Because if you ask a, uh, 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 an uphiller, and you listen to their answers, you, you might together come to appreciate that they have experienced being othered themselves. And what an opening for a conversation that is. So last week, Susanna Davis gave us three maxims, and one of them was, you know what to do. <laughs> I bet that generated some discussion last week. I would say that with radical disagreements, you may not feel like you know what to do. But I would say this with confidence, you know how to be. So I'm just going to finish up by offering a few questions that you can use as you move forward. And these are from a group um, called Conversation Cafe. And I have them printed on a little wallet-sized card. So you, like, you can get these and you can keep them in your wallet. 
Uh, and these cards have reminders of um, their civility reminders. They're, they're not unlike the grounding virtues actually that we use with this group. Things like having an attitude of curiosity and discovery, uh, speaking with sincerity uh, and from personal experience. Um, brevity, that's always a good one. But then my favorite part, it lists specific questions that you can ask. So the next time you're in conversation and on the verge of becoming uncivil, you could try stepping back and asking authentically, what happened that led you to this point of view? How does this affect you personally? I'm curious, can you say more about that? Here's what I heard, is that what you mean? Take a breath, try to discover the concerns beneath the stances, the interests beneath the positions. I think in befriending radical disagreement, there's no more powerful tool than listening. So those are my comments for today. Thank you so much, Susan. 